right, well, welcome everybody. We are in now our second week of a series we're doing called Soul Detox. And so um, the whole idea about this series, and it's what we call our campaign series, basically what that means is not only do we talk about it here on Sunday, but then we get together throughout the week in home groups to take the discussion a little bit further. Now, the whole idea about this is clean living in a contaminated world. How do we move from some of the stuff that has permeated our lives to finding that? And so last week, we talked about a toxic tongue or the toxic words, maybe the things that people have said about you, the things you've believed about yourself, and even more powerful, I think, is some of the things that we say to ourselves. Some of those words that we say are toxic, and how do we get away from that? Today, we're going to be talking about scare pollution. So the idea today is fear. Now, look, if you haven't yet got into one of our life groups, there's still an opportunity to get involved, so we invite you to sign up for that. You can find myself or Pastor Eric um, in your your bulletin. There's some information on that. And so, so today, we're going to talk about fear. Now, anybody else in here think it's fun to scare people? Like, anybody else, like, take some enjoyment out of that? I do, okay? I have ever since I was little. Okay, Briar, do you enjoy that? You like scaring people? Me too. Okay, let let me just tell, let's talk about the slippery slope that was my childhood. So I had two sisters, the only boy and the oldest. Um, One Halloween, or I, I don't know, maybe it was at Goodwill, I bought one of the scary masks, and my mom didn't know, because there's no way she'd let that devil mask in her house. Um... Here's what I would do. My mom would put the girls to bed, you know, and she wouldn't always come checking me. I would hide in the closet, okay? Because obviously there's monsters in the closet, right? Or at least everybody thinks that. That's not true, kid. I I, I need to be sensitive. There are children in here. It's not true, okay? It's mean older brothers that are actually hiding in the closet. Now, and hey, man, no ideas, right? Okay, you don't take this home and be like, don't take notes right now, okay? Okay. Because I'll tell you, all of this led to spankings, and many of them, okay? (laughs) And if your parents don't do that, then there's going to be groundings, and they're going to take your video games away, and it's all going to go bad for you. So anyway, I would hide in the closet, right? I'd have my mask on. I'd wait till the lights go out. I'd have a flashlight. I would jump out of the closet and be like, My sisters would be like, My parents would run into the room, and they're like, what are you doing? And I'm just dying laughing, and then they spank me, and that's sad. And then, but I mean, it didn't end there. Like I can remember, I would I would sneak outside their room and like say mask, and I just like bam up against the window, and they're like, you know, not expecting it. Well, see, I thought this was fun, right? So I thought, man, when I get married, I'm gonna have a good time. <laughs> I didn't have the mask anymore, but. You know, like, I'd wait for my wife to come around the corner. I'd be like, yeah! And she'd be like, do it! Don't do that! You know what I mean? She'd get mad at me. Fi- finally, I realized this was not going to go good for my marriage because I crossed, I crossed the line. I, I, heard the, I came home. I heard the shower going. I knew, you know, she was taking a shower. She wouldn't know. I snuck into the bathroom. She's oblivious. She's, like, singing and just having a good old time. And I went, hey! And grabbed her. I know. She like went, like almost had a heart attack, like literally, um, and, 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 and screamed at me a lot and basically said, if you want to stay married to me and have the ability to still have children, you need to stop this now. Okay? So my, my scaring days of my spouse are over. I just lived through it vicariously on YouTube. There's some great videos of of people scaring their significant other it just doesn't work well for me in my marriage if i do that so so i've moved beyond that now just to kind of create a baseline here as we talk about fear most fear is kind of learned okay in fact the the experts say there's two fears you're actually born with right it's the fear of falling and a fear of loud noises see some of you right there some are just irritated sorry but fear of falling and a fear of loud noises, those are the only two fears we're actually born with, right? And you, you understand this because it's like your little baby, you know, if all of a sudden you're like, hey, all of a sudden the baby's like, <gasps> and then the face changes and that's it. You know what I mean? It's because that loud noise, it scared them. So those are the only two fears we we're born with. But obviously we pick up fears 
along the way in life, right? And some fears are just silly. Like, I mean, for real, like spiders. Really? It's like that big. It's just got long legs. I mean, it's that, come on, for real, like, or snakes. It's a little snake. Like, just kick it. You know what I mean? It's like, there's some people that are like, oh, no, like, they can't even see it on TV or they, like, go into shock. Um, or, like, we were on a little vacation, okay? We're in my mom's, uh, in my mom, my sister's house is right next to a cornfield in Indiana. So we're sitting there watching a movie, and all of a sudden, Belinda's sister, if you remember, she visited a couple weeks ago. She's from Spain. She, like, jumped up on the couch because there was this little black thing just kind of scooting across the floor. It was a mouse, okay? She was like, Grace, kill it, kill it, kill it. And I'm like, what am I supposed to kill it with? I don't have a shotgun. Like, how... It's a mo- they're not easy to kill. That's why you need traps and stuff. Okay? I have a shotgun at home, but it's not with me here. It's, I tried to stab it. It was fast. It got away. She's like, I'm not even going to be able to sleep tonight. And I was like, just tuck, tuck towels underneath your door. It'll be okay. They can't get in. I think it went to the basement anyway. And, you know, and then there's some others of you, you like might be afraid of like public speaking. Like, really? Come on. It's not that hard. Once you get up here, do it a few times. Easy. In fact, anybody want to just conquer that fear right now? No? No? Okay. Some of you like, don't look at me. Um, heights, right? There might be some of you in here, you might be scared of heights, which really you're not scared of heights. You're more scared of the fall, right? The height's not a big deal. It's, it's the falling. We saw that too. We were in Chicago. You ever done the, the towers where you can actually like walk out on that piece of glass and you're like standing out there and you're, you know, what are you, 108 stories up, 106 stories up, and so it's glass. Some of you right now, like, there's just this weird feeling in your stomach just thinking about that, okay? That's silly. I don't understand some of these fears you guys got. Um, Tight spaces, right? Anybody, like, claustrophobic, can't stand that, you know? I'm I'm a little bit there. Um, Clowns, is there anybody, is there any clown fearful people in here? If so, please don't watch that new show, American Freak Show or whatever, um, it's, they got a crazy clown on there. I, I know a youth pastor who's deadly afraid of clowns. I just want to like tweet him pictures all the time just to mess with him. There's some goofy fears out there. And then there are some legitimate fears. I mean, there's some fears that require fear like birds. Don't laugh. It's not funny. Birds are like demons with wings, man. I mean, they got beaks, they can fly in, they can peck your eyes out and get away, and you can't do nothing about it. See, stop it, because y'all are taking pleasure in my pain here, and there is a reason, yeah, that's good, that's funny, right? There is a reason why, man, for real, all right? So, so growing up, my grandpa, he had chickens, okay? And grandpa was like six foot four, I think he wore a size 14 shoe. I'd follow him into the, the chicken coop, no worries. Because the chicken got close, he'd punt the thing across the coop, you know? <laughs> so when I was a little kid, I thought, I was like, well, I'm going to take a stick. I just would poke at him and stuff through the fence. I'd mess with him, okay? One day I went in with Grandpa, and he wasn't watching. And they're smart, right? Some rooster jumped in my face and was like, ah, you know? <laughs> now, if that wasn't it, I'd be maybe okay. But that's not where the story ends. See, Grandpa also would butcher the chickens, right? Because he'd use them for meat. Well, it's true. You ever heard like chicken? Nobody knows about farm stuff anymore. Chicken with the head cut off. That's real. You cut a chicken's head off, it still runs. And it flops all over the place. Well, that bruised the meat according to him. So his idea was, we'll kill the chicken and then we hang them from the clothesline so they can flop around, but they're not bruising themselves. So Grandpa's killing them. I'm out there like, yeah, that's the one that tried to get me. Get him, Grandpa, you know. I'm on this little makeshift treehouse, right? Grandpa cuts the head off, and he's like, he, it's flipping, and, and he can tell I'm afraid, so he's messing with me, so he brings it close. Well, I kind of fall off the treehouse. It's not high, so I mean, it's not a big deal, except for when he tried to catch me, he lets go of the chicken. Here's how it all ends up. I'm on the ground, dead chicken with its heads cut off, flapping on my face with a little vein flipping around like this, <laughs> blood and stuff. I'm telling you, man, like... It's not a joke. Birds are not good to me, okay? I went to London, like Trafalgar Square, where all the pigeons... I just put my coat over my head and ran. I know everybody was laughing, but uh, it's legit. There's fears out there that are legit. So here's the deal. Whatever the truth is, we're all afraid of something, okay? You may not be afraid of birds, 
But there are common fears that most of us have. And I I call this the not-so-fabulous four. The first fear, fear of loss. What happens if I lose somebody? What happens if that person dies? What happens if I lose my job? What happens if we lose our house? What happens if everything comes apart? What happens if I lose my marriage? These are a lot of fears that that people get plagued with. I I just need to say something real quick. Yesterday I went to a funeral of a two-month-old, okay? Those are the hardest. I mean, those are the ones that you're like, man, really? Here's the thing, though. The whole time, there was this, this common idea that God took this little baby. Can, can I just pastor for a second? God did not take that baby. We live in a fallen world, and bad things happen to good and bad people. God never scripted out to take a little... The Bible says the, the God has come to give us life and life to the full. The devil's come to lie, cheat, kill, and destroy. And it, I almost hijacked the funeral. I'll just be real. I almost did. Because I just almost couldn't take the fact that they kept saying, God took them, God took them, God took them. And then the pastor didn't change their mindset. And I'm like, I don't want people to walk out of here feeling that way. So I pray for those people that God would reveal himself to them the right way because he didn't take them. But here's what I know about God. And this is why I love him. He can make purpose out of my pain. You understand that? It wasn't his script, but he can still write a better one when it's all said and done. You understand? He didn't plan it, but he can make it better. Okay? That's what, I, that's what I love about God. So the fear of loss. Another one is a fear of failure. There's some of you in here, you may have that. What if I fail? What if I try and it doesn't work out? Right? The fear of rejection. I'm sure nobody has that, right? No one. Right? It means like, how many of you, you know, when you're dating, you never ask somebody out because you were afraid they would say no? You know, I'm not going to ask that person. What if they don't want me? What if they don't like me? What if, you know what I mean? It's like, in fact, we used to do stupid. I don't even know what kids, do you guys text now? Like, we did stupid things. Like, we wrote notes with, like, circle yes or no or maybe. Okay? Just so you're saying I got a chance, right? Okay. Um, And then some people, it's the fear of the unknown. What's going to happen? Where's my life going to end up? What if this all comes apart, right? So we all have, like, four of these common fears that we call the not-so-fabulous four. Now, Jesus asks this question. He says, you know what, when you worry, can you worry yourself into more life? Can you worry yourself into more time? In fact, he says it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27. Just read it up on the screen with me. Jesus is saying this, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? See, because here's the truth, church. Fear is your enemy. Do you understand that? Like, fear is not a safeguard. Fear is not something that is intended to keep you protected. Fear is something that is meant to paralyze you. The Bible says fear does not come from God. Okay? It has nothing to do with him. He is not the author of fear. Okay? Some of you, you might be paralyzed in fear. Look, can I just be honest? Let me pastor for a second. There might be some of you in this room, you're living with somebody that should be your spouse. Okay? Now, we love you, and we are so glad you're here. Do you understand that? Like, we're not here to judge you. We're not here to point fingers at you. But let me speak some truth for a minute. The reason you haven't made that person your spouse is because of fear. Because if I marry that person, what if it doesn't work out? What if we go and do it the legal way, and then we break up, and then we have to do the divorce thing? It's just easier to live with this person. It's just easier to do life this way. Look, I get that, and I understand that. And coming up in a marriage where I didn't see my parents do it right, I was afraid to death to get married. Not so much, I mean, my wife is amazing, but my fear came from, what if I mess up? What if I end up just like my dad? I step out on my wife, I do these things. What if I blow this thing? Here's the thing, though. This is why fear is your enemy. Because God wants to bless your relationship. Do you understand that? Do you understand that God wants to infuse himself in your relationship? Can I be so honest as to say, you cannot make marriage work without Jesus. Okay? You just can't. Because we're called to be selfless, which means I'm supposed to put her above myself. Do you realize there is nothing inside of me that desires to put somebody else above myself? That doesn't come from me. That comes only from my relationship with Christ. Do you understand that? So this is why it's a big deal. When we're doing it our own way, God's not our grandpa. He doesn't just bless things because he likes us. 
Okay? He cannot bless it when we do it our way and not according to his way. Does that make sense? Here's why I want you to get away from that fear. Because I want you to experience the fullness of a relationship that is infused with the blessing of God. The enemy would love to keep you locked up in fear. Well, what if this and what if that? Look, it doesn't matter because God is able. He's able to take somebody like me who had no reference of how to do marriage the right way. I got connected with some right people. I decided, look, I half kind of did things my whole life, but I wasn't going to half do my marriage. And I've worked really hard at it, and I'm not saying it's the best, but it's pretty good. Actually, it's really good. It's really good. And it's because we worked at it. And it's because we put the effort in. And I don't care who you are, what your past looks like. If you'll put the effort in, you can have the type of relationship you've only dreamed of. If you'll do it his way. Make sense what I'm saying? Some of you are like, I don't like that. That's okay. Look, we love people and we're just going to preach the truth. And if you don't like it, I'm not saying you got to buy everything we're selling. I'm just telling you this. I'm going to speak the truth whether people like it or not. Because I think I'm tired of hearing people. Look, I'm, I don't want to hear people telling me things. I want to hear, tell me the truth. And if it takes you a while to come to that truth, that's fine with us. Do you understand that? This church, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay. To, you can come to this church and not even know Jesus or really want to know Jesus. But for some reason, something's drawn you. We're happy you're here. Amen? Come on now. All right. So... Fear never comes from God. 2 Timothy 3.1 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Some people believe that fear is the opposite of faith. But let me tell you the truth. The truth is this. Fear is putting your faith in the wrong thing. See, because it takes faith to have fear. But it's putting your faith in the wrong thing. Fear is putting your faith in the what-ifs instead of God is. Okay? And that's what I want to nail down today. There are way too many people who live their life always afraid of what if, what if, what if. You know what? It changes when you stop focusing on the what if and you get your mind on the God is. Because it doesn't matter what happens, God is still in control. It doesn't matter what happens, God still got you. It doesn't matter if it all comes apart, God's still for you. See, and when we get our mind off the what if and back to the God is, anything that happens in your life, you're going to be okay. Not saying it's going to be easy, but you're going to come through. Now, Exodus 3 and 4, we see an example of this, all right? Moses. Everybody remember Moses, right? The guy with the broad and the Ten Commandments, let my people go, you know? Moses. Now, there might be some people in here, you're like, you know, I'm not really sure about this Christianity thing. I read the Bible. It sounds to me like just a book of stories. Let me show you why I believe the Bible is absolutely truth. Because here's the deal, okay? Moses, according to what we know, wrote the first five books of the Bible, okay? So he wrote Exodus chapter 3 and 4, okay? If you were writing about yourself, would you write about your failures? Would you write about your mistakes, Because Moses did, all right? So Exodus 3, 4, chapter 3, Moses comes up to a burning bush. Now, here's the the irony. The bush is on fire, but it's really not burning, okay? And then all of a sudden, the bush starts speaking to him, tripping out a little bit, right? And it's like, Moses, the place you're standing is holy ground. Take off your sandals, and God encounters Moses at this bush, right? How many would be like, this is crazy, okay? Okay? And I don't think Moses was on anything, so I don't think there was LSD back then, so the bush was really talking to him, okay? So, anyway, Moses is encountering God right here. And God basically says, Moses, listen to me. I hear the cries of my people in Egypt, and I'm going to use you to go get them. Let's talk about Moses' what-ifs. Because here's the conversation he has with God. The first thing he basically says is, God, what if I'm not good enough? Right? What if I go and they don't believe you really sent me? What if I go and this doesn't work out? What if you've got the wrong guy? Who am I that you should send me? Is basically what he says. God, what if I'm not good enough? Okay? And then God goes, look, it ain't about you, Moses. It's about me. I am is the one who is sending you. I'm the one that's behind you. You go anyway. And if that's not enough, then Moses goes, um, okay, one more question. What if they don't believe me? Like, what if I get there and they're like, 
you're not really him. You're not really from God. You're just a crazy guy out in the desert who got a little too much sun, and now you've lost your mind. So God's like, hey, Moses, what do you have in your hand? A rod. Throw it on the ground. <sighs> Did it. Turn into a snake. Some of you have been running at that point. Totally missed what God had to say to you. He threw his rod on the ground. It turned into a snake, and then God said, pick it back up, and it turned back into a rod. And he's like, Moses, I will give you signs and wonders to prove to these people you're my representative. All right. I don't know about you, but about then I'd be like, I can do that. I'm in. Okay? Like, that's cool. You know? He actually even had him stick his hand inside of his his robe, pull it out. It turned leprous. He said, put it back in, and it healed. So he's like, I'm behind you. You got me? I'm with you. So what's next? He's about to go on, and God's, he's like, okay, God, one more thing. You know I got a stuttering problem, right? Like, I'm not really a good talker. Can you just, can you pick somebody else? Like, because I I can't even talk. So God keeps revealing himself, revealing himself. And he's like, what if I get there and my words don't come out? What if I get there and they laugh at me because I stutter? And the Bible says God got mad with him. (laughs) Okay? Now, can you imagine this for a second, church? You're writing the, 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 the book of the Bible. And God's giving you the words to say. And as you're writing this down, I'm sure you're writing with hesitation. Like, do I really have to tell these people that? Like, you know, do I really have to tell them how I doubted you? Do I really have to tell them how I I didn't believe that you could do? After showing me all these things, and then God's like, Moses, you understand I was mad at you? Because I'm showing you, I'm calling you, I'm behind you, and you just keep making excuses. In fact, the very end, Moses basically says this, please, could you just pick somebody else? I don't want to go. And God finally goes, I will send your brother Aaron with you, you go. See, when we live our life in the what if, we miss out on the fact that God is. And unfortunately, if Moses wouldn't have went, he could have missed that opportunity to be the one to bring those people out of Egypt. See, fear paralyzes us. Most of us, when we're growing up, here's the truth. We didn't live our lives with what ifs. Do you understand? I'm saying most of us. When I was growing up, There was always food on the table. We had clothes. I mean, they might have come from the goodwill, but we still had clothes because we weren't weren't rich by any imagination. I mean, we had everything we needed. We didn't worry so much about what's going to happen. Am I going to have enough food to eat? Am I going to have clothes? Where are we going to sleep tonight? That stuff wasn't a worry for me. Those are the things. And here's the reason why. Because I knew even though my parents maybe didn't have all the money in the world, they would move heaven and earth to make it work for us. Do you understand what I'm saying? They would do anything they could to make sure we had what we needed. Even if they would have to go to bed hungry, they would go the extra mile to make sure their kids ate. Okay? So I didn't worry about those things because I understood my parents and how much they loved us. Church, when you know who God is, your what-ifs can change to God is. See, the problem is, too many of us know about God, we've heard stories, we come to Christmas and Easter service, but we never get the concept of who he really is. That he is for you and not against you. That he is on your side, that he is stepping in your behalf. So today, I want to move us from the what if to God is. And we're going we're gonna to close it down this way. I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 56. Come on up, Tyler. Go ahead and turn there now. And as we do that, I want to set this up for you, okay? I want to talk to you real quick about David, right? Now, some of you, you may not be familiar with church, but you've probably heard the story about the little boy who took a rock and knocked out the giant, right? Just knocked him out cold. See, and and oftentimes, that's all we hear about the story, but the story starts way before that. See, David, David didn't have a great upbringing, okay? David wasn't in the best environment. At the time in Israel, there was a king. And the king was one that God appointed. But even though he was king, he started to do his own thing. And God finally said, I'm done with this man as king. I'm going to pick a new one. So he told this prophet, he said, I want you to go to the house of Jesse which happened to be David's dad. And I want you to go there because one of those boys is going to be the new king. So go there because I'm going to use you to anoint the new king of Israel. 
So if you know the story, he goes there to anoint this new king, and, and Jesse brings all of his boys before, Je- or excuse me, Jesse brings all of his boys before the prophet. And each one the prophet looks at and goes, not it, not it, not it, not it. And he looks back at Jesse and he says, none of these. Is this all your sons? Oh yeah, I've got another son. But he's out in the field watching a couple sheep. Some would be like, he didn't even get invited to the party. Do you get that? Like, can you understand rejection? Like, dad is called to bring all of his sons in and you weren't invited. And most people believe the reason why was because David wasn't a legitimate kid. That Jesse might have been his daddy, but somebody else was the mom. So he didn't even consider him as the one. And then the story goes on that they bring David in. Jesse goes, or Jesse's like, this is, this is it. And then the prophet looks at David and says, this is the one. And he anoints him king. That's awesome. Now he's going to be king, but that, that's not how the story goes. Because he gets sent back out into the field to watch the few sheep. Because even though the, prof, the prophet's probably nuts, because there's no way God's going to use that kid. And so the story goes on that, that his brothers go off to war, and now David's like, goes to take care of his brothers, bring him food and supplies. He goes to the battlefield, and that's where the whole giant thing takes place. David's looking, every, this giant's talking trash. David's like, nobody's going to do anything. David's like, this, this is crazy. I'm going to kill him. I'm, give me, I'm going. Right? Little kid. And they're like, what do, you, what do you mean you? There's no way you can do this. But see, while he was out in that field, he learned how to use his sling because bears used to come and try and take his sheep. And while he was out in that field, he also learned how to worship God. Because it's easy to worship God sometimes when you're feeling lonely and all alone because that's all you have is God and a couple sheep. That's where he learned how to worship and be a warrior. And so he goes, and the Bible says he kills that giant, and everyone's like, you're the coolest ever. And because he could worship really good, the king hires him to be his personal musician, okay? And he has this thing in the back of his head. One day, he's going to be king. In fact, the king becomes his father-in-law. Because he kills a giant, the king gives him his daughter to marry. There's only one problem. When you start to be successful and you're underneath a crazy king, the king got jealous. And so here's what started to take place. The king got mad at David because he was hearing the people say how great David was, how awesome David was. And he goes, you know what? I got to get rid of this kid. In fact, he got so mad one day while he was in his throne room playing his harp, the Bible says he picked up a spear and he threw it at him. And David ducked, so he lived. So now David flees for his life. So you go from the kid that nobody wants to being picked to be king and then you succeed and you think your time has finally come and now the king of the country has put a death warrant on you and told his soldiers, the man who brings me his head will be rewarded beyond anything they could ever imagine. The king sent his entire army to find one man and put him to death. And David now is hiding in a cave. And he writes this in Psalms 12. He says this, Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long they press their attack. My adversaries pursue me all day long. In their pride, many are attacking me. Now listen, catch this, don't miss this. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, God, whose word I praise. In God I trust, I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Do you understand what he's saying? Look, I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't understand why this stuff is happening to me. But here's what I know. In your word, you say you're going to be there for me. You say you're going to watch out for me. You say you got me. You say you'll be my defender. So I'm not going to live in my fear. I'm going to live in your word. I'm going to trust your word. Church, if you want to move your fear into faith, you got to get in this word. Do you understand? You've got to get back to this. I understand what you think. I understand that your perception sometimes becomes your reality. But let me introduce you to the truth. And the truth is what he says about you, not how you feel about you. That's truth right there. Some of you are like, this preacher has lost his mind a little bit. 
little bit because there's way too many people who live their life based on their fear, their emotions, and their feelings when he gives me the ability to stand firm in any circumstance if I'll just cling to his word. That's why every week you get a take home. Every week there's something with scripture on it that you can take home and you can meditate. We've got one this week for you. We want you to grab that take it home. Six verses all on what God says about fear. All on what he says about how do you overcome fear. Take these verses home, one each day. Meditate on them. Remind yourself when fear starts to creep in. There's some of you who are like, man, what if I go back to that addiction? God has not given you a spirit of fear. Do you understand that? And even if you do, if you'll confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all your mistakes. He makes provision for it. It doesn't end there. David goes on to say, all day long they twist my words. All their schemes are for for my ruin. They conspire, they lurk, they watch my steps, hoping to take my life because of their wickedness. Do not let them escape in your anger. God, bring the nations down. Record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Some of you, you need to take, stop and pause for just one second, and you need to hear that. Do you hear what he says? All my tears, are they not in your record? There are some of you in this room, you thought you have cried yourself to sleep, so many nights and nobody cares but according to what his word says he takes record of every one of those tears those matter to him you don't serve a God who's distant saying come up to me the Bible says he's as close as a brother the Bible says that even in your darkest moments he's right there with you do you understand what I'm saying you might feel alone that's just a feeling because the truth of the word says he's there and he's keeping count he's keeping record all those nights you've prayed for that lost son or that lost daughter and you felt like nobody heard you I'm telling you he's keeping record and he will pay in full in time then he says this then my enemies will turn back when I call for help by this I will know God is for me he says when I call for help my enemies will turn back because you see when I pray When I begin to pray, when I lift up my voice to God and I begin to call out to Him, He will answer me and my enemies will see that. The first thing, if you're going to turn your faith to fear, you got to get in His Word. And the next thing is, once you start getting the truth right, then you can pray. Because too often when it's our feelings, we pray from our feelings and not from His truth. Once you got the truth right, then you start to pray. And then you start to remind yourself. And here, let me be honest with you. Prayer doesn't fix everything. It doesn't mean all your circumstances are going to change. But I'll tell you what it does do. It changes you. It changes your perspective. It helps you to get your mind around what God is trying to do instead of being looking at your circumstances the whole time. And then he ends with this. In God whose word I praise. Worship team, get up here, please. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust and I am not afraid. What can man do to me? The last thing we do is we worship. Why do we worship? Worship it. We don't just sing because it's what you do when you come to church. There's a purpose in worship. Worship is so I can get my focus back on the one who I'm supposed to be focusing on. See, that's why Hebrews chapter 12 says this, fixing my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, who the joy set before him endured the cross. See, because when I'm focused on my issues and my problems and my circumstances and my situations, that's what my mind is consumed with. But when I focus on Him, all that stuff starts to fade out because I get my eyes back on where they're supposed to be. Like Peter, when he stepped out on the water and he started to walk and the Bible says he took his eyes off Jesus and he started to stink. As soon as he put his eyes back on Jesus, he was able to walk on top church if you'll get your eyes back on christ you'll be able to walk on top of your problems i'm not saying it's all going to change i can't promise that i don't i don't know why i can't i couldn't tell those people yesterday why they were burying their two-month-old baby but i can tell them this if you'll put your eyes on jesus he'll make purpose out of your pain he'll give you hope in the midst of this hopelessness See, and that's who we serve, and that's why. That's why I don't want you to be bound up by fear. That's why fear is your enemy. That's why fear is trying to stop you. And it's time to break that chokehold. But here's the deal. Close your eyes, bow your head. Because this is truth right now. 
If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus, if you're in this room and you've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior, he will come and he will be for you. But you've got to choose to live for him. You've got to choose to lay your life down. You've got to choose to allow him to become the Lord and Savior of your life. And if you're willing to do that this morning, I'm telling you, it will be the greatest decision you ever make. It will be the hardest. We ain't even going to lie about that. But it's going to be the greatest. So if that's you, you're in this room, you say, Pastor, I've never asked Christ to come into my heart. I've never accepted him. I've never, or maybe, maybe you used to go to church when you were a little kid. But you would be honest and say, man, my life is just not right with God. And today, I want to get things right. Today, I want to ask him to come back into my life. And that's, just, that's so much more than just a prayer. It's saying, God, I'm going to live my life according to your word and not my own. I'm not going to live by my own feelings. I'm not going to live by my own desires. I'm going to live according to what you asked me to do. And yeah, I'm going to mess up. Yeah, I'm going to blow it. But I'm going to give it my best to be the person that you want me to be. If that's you and you're ready to make that choice this morning with nobody looking around, just raise your hand and say, pray for me, man. I need to get my heart right with Christ. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. That's awesome. Those are great decisions you've made. Great decisions. Just want to pray for you real quick. Lord, I thank you for those hands that were raised. God, your word says that if we'll confess you, if we ask you to come into our heart, to forgive us of all of our sins, you'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, we, we don't just believe that you're a good idea or a good story. We believe that you lived according to your word, that you died on a cross for all of our sins. But when they put you in a grave, three days later, you came back. You defeated death. You defeated sin. So I don't have to live a slave to sin anymore, but I can be set free. And I pray for every person that raised their hand and and just asked you to be a part of that that journey with them today. And God, I believe in Jesus' name that you're going to continue to do the work. Now, one last thing. How many people in this room are like, Pastor, I struggle with fear. I struggle with fear. It might be the what if, it might be the fear of loss, but there's fear in my life and I'm so sick of it. And today I want things to change. I want you to pray for me that things are going to stop. I don't want to live in fear anymore. I want to move my, my fear from the what if to the God is. If that's you and you're in this room and you want, you want to break that, that hold of fear on your life, I want you just to raise your hand and say, pray for me. I'm tired of living in fear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to put step three into practice. Everybody up on your feet. If you raised your hand and you meant that, man, there might be somebody in this room, you're afraid. You're, you're, you're fearful of like, what should I do next? What am I supposed to do with my life? Don't focus on that question. Focus on the one who's calling you. Because he's got the answer for you. If you'll just listen to him and draw close to him, he'll speak that to you. We're going to worship God. We're going to sing this song. I want you, if you raise your hand, I want you just to, to sing with your eyes focused on Christ and let him speak that truth to your heart right now.